Hello, my name is Dr. James Tilke, and today we're going to provide an instructional video on how to better use the Tilke forceps. The Tilke forceps was invented as an alternative to the traditional McGill forceps. After one weekend of having to do 12 nasotracheal intubations in a row, it became clear to me that the McGill forcep invented by Sir Ivan McGill in 1919 was outdated and there are several things that needed to be improved in the process. After doing 12 intubations nasotracheally over a 36 hour period, it became apparent to me that first and foremost, the ergonomics of the instrument were terrible. The hand is pronated, the elbow is kind of out, your hand is down. This is not really a, a position of great dexterity and the instrument then visually obstructs you and your hand is kind of in the picture while you're trying to look in the mouth. So the first problem with the McGill forceps is, is one of ergonomics. It just doesn't feel comfortable and the McGill forceps is not weighted properly. It just doesn't feel good in your hand and actually your, your shoulder can actually start to cramp up if you hold it in this position too long. So if you're trying to do a nasotracheal intubation on somebody and it's difficult and the anatomy is unfavorable, somebody's big or small or bleeding or a broken jaw and you have your laryng laryngoscope here and then you have your hand in the visualization of, of the picture and you're also trying to look at the vocal cords, this becomes a very congested picture. So the ergonomics of the elbow and the ergonomics of the instrument along with the visual obstruction were two big problems I wanted to solve immediately. This is not comfortable, this doesn't feel good, you can't really even see the cords. The second problem is that you can see at the end of the McGill forceps that this is a serrated tip. It's, it's sharp. And it, was, and it made sense when the original breathing tubes were made out of rubber in 1919. But, the, but since the 40s or, or early 50s, endotracheal tubes or, or breathing tubes have been made out of polyvinyl chloride, which is plastic. And so the plastic is already somewhat slippery. And then when you take into account blood and secretions and lubrication for the tube that you use so that you can easily pass through the nasal passage and, and put this tube in the back of the pharynx, it's just really difficult to grab this tube. And you'll notice a lot of people when they do nasotracheal intubations, they will put this tube in a warm bottle of solution to soften the tube up. And the reason that they want to put it in a bottle of warm saline or something is to add greater flexibility to this tube. Well, why do you need greater flexibility? Because with this instrument, you're grabbing and trying to bend a firm tube. Well, with the Tilke forcep, you're not going to ever lose control of that tube. So you no longer will have to warm the tubes to provide greater flexibility. Another problem with the, with the traditional McGill forcep is that this serrated tip tears the cuff from time to time. There's nothing worse than grabbing the tube in the back of the pharynx, pushing it or placing it through the cords and finally getting in and then going to insufflate this cuff and find that you can't because the cuff has been torn by the sharp edge of the McGill forcep. That's the kind of frustration that nobody likes, where you have to completely start over and completely repeat the process. And the fifth problem with the McGill forceps is you're actually placing the tube through the cords or throwing the tube at the cords. That's not very scientific. I don't want to. I don't want to make placing a tube a, 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 a gamble. I don't want to have to hope that the tube goes through the cords. And so the Tilke forceps solves these five problems. The problem of ergonomics, the problem of visualization, the problem of grabbing the tube, the problem of the torn cuff, and the problem of getting the tube through the cords without damage. Because of all the problems that I, felt, I discovered or I realized with the McGill forcep, although it's evident to anybody who uses it that there's a lot of problems, but after quantifying the five problems with the McGill forcep, I developed the Tilke forceps. How does the Tilke forceps solve these five problems? Number one, 3D computer design has allowed me to develop the forcep or make the forcep or design the forcep so that it's an extension of your arm and your hand, resulting in greater dexterity and less fatigue of the muscles while use, utilizing the instrument. Number two, the patented twist, the first twist in a medical forcep, first twist ever in any medical instrument in 8,000 years, along with this bend allows you to keep the forcep off to the side and therefore you see greater visualization of the vocal cords as you're looking in the airway, this is off to the side. 
Number three, when you grip the tube, either coming in from the side, sliding over the end, or coming down on top, are the three methods most common with engagement. Again, if the tube is, if, if the operator goes into the airway, uses the ringoscope, lifts up the tongue and jaw, and the tube is sitting right there and it's hanging in air in the pharynx, then you can just come in from the side and, and easily grab the tube. If the tube is pressed against the back of the throat or the posterior pharynx, which can happen, then I would recommend coming in on top of the tube, grabbing it, and then restoring it to the vertical position. Another way you can grab it, uh, either when, if this tube is floating in the air or wherever it is in the airway, is you can come in and slide this right over the tip. So those are the three ways, grabbing it from the side, taking it over the top, or coming down on it and twisting it up. So no matter where the tube is in the posterior pharynx or at the back of the throat, you can engage the tube this way. And so once you engage the tube, you can see that you're not gonna tear the cuff. You can slide this back and forth inside the forcep. You don't, care, you don't catch the cuff, you don't tear the cuff, it slides through. And then on top of it, once you grab the tube, you just aim to where you want the tube to go. If there's a fracture or the anatomy is deranged, you just find your vocal cords and aim it and have your assistant advance the tube and the tube will, will go through the cords. Typically a forcep by history grabs and firmly holds a tube. This is a forcep where you're not firmly grasping the tube. You're just encircling the tube. The tube is in play. If you want to, you can go to the corner and you can grab the tube and turn it into a forcep and advance it that way. That's another way you can use it. But typically most people will just grasp it and the tube will be loose inside the gapped circle and you're just aiming it. It has been our experience that the easiest way to disengage the forcep is to come back a, a little bit higher in the, in the oropharynx. You don't want to disengage down here, especially in kids. If you're down in a little kid and you're using an instrument this small and you don't have much space, you don't want to open that forcep down there. You want to pull the forcep back to the greater space, which would be the oropharynx, which would be the which is the optimum place to engage and disengage this instrument is in the oropharynx. You don't want to disengage where it's tight down there. Even though you don't only need to open the gap approximately 1.2 millimeters. 1.4 millimeters with the adolescent and 1.6 millimeters with the adult, you only need to open that small amount to disengage the tube. It's still easier to disengage the tube up higher in the oropharynx. So when you're when you're disengaging, so when you're disengaging the tube, we recommend that you pull it back to the oropharynx and then rotate it a little bit to the bottom so that the gap is almost to the top, opening the forcep that small little amount and then closing that forcep and backing it out of the mouth carefully. And then you have disengaged and you have placed a, your nasotracheal tube and performed the task of nasotracheal intubation in a much more efficient and safe manner than what the traditional McGill will provide.